This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome, everybody, to Mitchell's Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Michael Klain, the Covenant Pastor here at Mitchell's, and I am just so delighted that you have tuned in to worship with us here on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, I just hope and pray that our time together in virtual worship will be a real blessing. So thank you once again for tuning in. I do also want to thank everyone in the Mitchell's congregation who has turned in their survey to the pastoral nominating committee. That information is going to be so important for them. So thank you so much for turning that in. They're going to be meeting and hammering out the rest of the uh, ministry information form. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And with that, I want to offer a prayer once again to the pastor nominating committee. So let's pray. Holy God, you know all things good for us, and your Holy Spirit leads us in your way. Guide the members of this committee to the one you have prepared to serve your people. Open their minds to discern your will and their hearts to consider all candidates fairly. Give them strength and endurance equal to the commitment they have made and mutual love and patience in the work that lies ahead. Prepare this congregation to receive their new minister with joy and instruct us all as we accept new ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So united together as one, wherever we may be this day, as the body of Christ, let us now call ourselves to worship. We are children of God learning to walk. Day by day, we are learning to be the church. God is a loving parent teaching us to walk. God loves us, leads us, and feeds us. Let us worship. Let us return to our God in confession, considering God's steadfast love. Let us pray. God of everlasting love, we confess that at times we have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another. We have worshipped other gods, money, power, greed, and convenience. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you and your people. We have not loved our neighbor as you have commanded, nor have we rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you and one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In Christ you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. Amen. Join me in prayer. God, we trust that you have our best interests at heart. As we hear the reading of your word, remind us that we have been raised with Christ, and inspire us to seek the things that are above, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, our first lesson today is coming to us from the Psalter. We're going to read Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9 and 43. Hear these words afresh and anew today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those He redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. 
For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things, and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Our second reading is from Luke's Gospel. We're reading the parable of the rich fool from chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Friends, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me once again. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in our reading from Luke today, Jesus is journeying with his followers, followers from village to village on his way to Jerusalem. They're traveling over hill and dale, past shepherds and farmers and fishermen, all while gathering these huge crowds who are eager to hear his teaching or just to ask him a question. And I just love how he takes these questions and turns them into teaching moments. Last week, we heard from Martha, who tried to put Jesus in the middle of a sisterly confrontation. Jesus, tell Mary to get in the kitchen and help me. And this week we are hearing from a random person, probably a male with an older brother, who wants Jesus to arbitrate in an estate manner. Teacher, tell my brother to divide up our family inheritance. Well, under Jewish law at that time, it was common for the eldest son to keep two-thirds and to divide the remaining third among the rest of the family. But just like today, conflicts arise and rabbis were often called in to settle the disputes. In that context, the question doesn't seem as random as it may seem. Though Jesus was not going to be sucked in, he uses it as another teaching moment. He dismisses the question and tells the crowd, Take care! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. But wait, I thought our motto was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and isn't happiness having a few things? You can hear the young man reply, Come on, Jesus, this inheritance is due to me, and I want what is rightfully mine. That just seems fair, but Jesus is warning us about greed, all kinds of greed. But what does that look like? What are all kinds of greed? Recall the minimum wage debates that have gone on in many states these past few years. You might remember when hundreds of fast food workers, mostly from Wendy's, but a few from other fast food chains, went on strike demanding an increase in the minimum wage. At the time, the minimum wage was stuck at $7.25 an hour. These workers were demanding that the wage be doubled to $15. Strikers were apparently chanting, we can't survive on $7.25. But isn't doubling the wage in one fell swoop being a bit greedy? 
And aren't we talking about whiny teenagers anyway who don't seem to care if they get my order just right? Well, according to various economic reports from 2019, the average age of a fast food worker is not 18, but 29. And 26% are parents of children, which carries different implications. These are not just part-time jobs. Quoting, if a worker today is employed full-time for 52 weeks, he or she is making just over 15000 a year, which is 31% below the poverty level for a family of three. On the other hand, in 2019, Wendy's president and CEO earned total compensation valued at close to $6.6 I mean, that's a lot of hamburgers and frosties. Is this greed? Isn't he just receiving what the market has determined to be a fair wage for a CEO? Is that wrong? What would Jesus say? The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I know what I will do. I will tear these barns down and build bigger barns. That's what I'll do. So he does it. He tears down the old barns and hires a local contractor to build a bigger barn. He opens a 401k, puts the windfall in an irrevocable trust, and tells himself, ah, soul, now we can relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. We have it all saved up. Then he dies the next night. Is Jesus telling us that saving for a rainy day is greedy? In Genesis, Joseph instructed the Pharaoh to store extra wheat so they would be prepared when the drought came. Isn't saving a, in the harvest in good years a good thing? Listen again to the parable. I have no place for the crops. I will do this. I will pull down my barns. I will store all my grain. I will say to my soul. Do you hear it? I, I, I. It's a totally egocentric conversation he's having with himself. That is why God calls him a fool. Not because he was saving, but only because he was focused just on himself. Last week we heard how Martha was distracted about many things. This rich man is distracted too. But he's not distracted about many things. No, he seems to be distracted about one thing and one thing only. And that is accumulating more possessions and then hoarding them all for himself. But I wonder, is there more? Was there something in this man's past experience that was distracting him? Was there something that was making him feel insecure about his future? Context is important. And I find it really interesting that Luke has placed this story in between telling us about the Lord's Prayer where we ask each day for our daily bread. And right before Jesus is going to tell us not to worry about what we will eat or drink because worry will not add a single minute to our life. Maybe the reason that we build bigger barns is because we are filled with anxiety and worry. We worry about yesterday and fret about tomorrow to the point we can't be present now. How do we get this way? I remember having some conversations with my grandparents about living during the Depression. It was interesting in that they never really perseverated on it with story after story, how life was just so hard or so terrible. No, the stories were few. But what was interesting was to see how their lifestyle grew out of that experience. You bought something and you used it forever. And so much so that the waffle iron that Tracy and I have is the one they received as a wedding present. Nothing was ever thrown away. You never knew when you might reuse it again. My grandmother had a closet full of old stuff. And I can still picture my grandfather with his pocket knife opening a present on Christmas Day. It would take him a full five minutes to cut loose 
all the tape so that paper could be used again. It drove me nuts as a kid. Now I'm all for reusing products as much as possible. But what we're talking about is a scarcity mentality that builds on the fear that there's not enough to go around. And while that can grow out of our past experience, this anxiety is fed and nurtured by the today's marketing. Just watch TV for a short time and you'll see what I mean. We're constantly being fed a message of insecurity and how to solve it. Some have called this type of marketing the, the deadly two-step waltz. First, you identify something you are insecure about, say how your body looks or your social status. And this gets exaggerated so that you start to feel bad and, and then they hit you with the solution. Try this weight loss plan or buy this new car, be the envy of all your neighbors. It'll make you feel good again. It's a vicious trap. But as soon as we start feeling bad, we, we start searching for the next new thing. And before we know it, we're basing our self-worth on what we own or possess. Instead of who we are as human beings created in the image of God. And I believe this is the crux of the matter. Our possessions begin to own us, and we just become inseparable from them. Now, does this mean we all need to develop a Franciscan lifestyle and give up all our earthly possessions? No. No, Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell all you have and follow me. And he was not able to do that. Because the lesson was not about selling the stuff that Jesus was concerned about. It was not being possessed by what he owned. The late comedian, George Carlin, he once said that the meaning of life is trying to find a place for your stuff. Houses, he said, are just piles of stuff with a cover on it. There are places we can keep our stuff while we go out and buy more stuff. He pokes fun in our building more and more barns for all of our stuff. Bigger houses, bigger garages, and storage units. All for our possessions. I think Jesus would chuckle and say, Right, don't store your treasures here on earth, but be rich towards God. Being rich towards God is using one's resources for the benefit of of one's neighbor in need, as we saw in the story of the Good Samaritan. Being rich toward God might mean being present in all we do, like Jesus encouraged Martha to be last week. Being rich toward God might be realizing that we are all in this together as a community, not lone rangers greedily hoarding everything for ourselves, like the toilet paper at the start of our pandemic. Being rich toward God may be going on strike so that your family can earn a living wage. Is 6.6 .6 million a year too much money for one person to make? I don't know. I think it's too easy for us to hear this parable and only hear the words, a rich man. This can set our bias. We might say, I'm not rich. This does not apply to me. This guy in our story was a huge landowner what we might call a corporate farmer today. So it's easy to just write this off as a lesson for someone else. But that temptation to build a bigger barn and to fill it with our trans treasured possessions, it belongs to all of us, young or old, rich or poor. Because the rich man in our story was not greedy because he was rich and had a full barn. He was greedy because he was saving for the wrong reasons. He had forgotten about stewardship, about helping those in need. We don't know why, but for whatever reason, he had lost sight of the one from whom all blessings flow. So what's in your barn? Thanks be to God. Our tradition here in Mitchell's is to respond with our Apostles' Creed. So let us now recite this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Thank you once again, everyone, for sending in your tithes and offerings this week to the church. For those that we've received, let us now pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the richness of our lives. Bless these tithes and offerings, that they may be used as an expression of your steadfast love for those in need, near and far. Amen. Ruach. Ruach is the Greek word for spirit. It can also be translated as breath. So as we come to this time of prayer, let's begin by taking just a couple of nice, deep, cleansing breaths and let ourselves be filled with that amazing spirit. As you breathe, just imagine the spirit filling your lungs and your body and your entire being. I would invite you just to take a deep breath and then let it out. And then maybe do that again. Let it out. This morning's prayer is from our Book of Common Prayer, and it was adapted from the Prayer Book of New Zealand. So I'm going to start with our prayer and then give us some time to pause at the end, and we'll finish with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, you cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Hear our prayers for your church and world. For the hungry and the overfed, may we have enough. For the mourners and the mockers, may we laugh together. For the victims and the oppressors, may we share power wisely. For the peacemakers and the warmongers, may clear truth and stern love lead us to harmony. For the silenced and the propagandists, may we speak our own words in truth. For the unemployed and the overworked, may our mark on this earth be kindly and creative. For the troubled and the secure, may we live together as wounded healers. For the homeless and the pampered, may our homes be simple, warm, and welcoming. For the vibrant and the dying, may we all die to sin and live to love. God, may you continue to bless this congregation with your power and your presence. Touch all that need our prayers today and all those on our prayer list and those whose needs may be known only to you. In our silence, remind us that you are always as close to us as our prayer. pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what's in your barn? Are we being good stewards of all that God has entrusted to us? Or are we hoarding it all for ourselves? May we work to build a world where there is enough for everyone. Remember this week to keep your pastor nominating committee and your session in prayer as they meet and gather together to do the work of this church. And know that you all are amazing. Continue to stay in contact with each other and know that you are so, so loved. May peace be with you. Receive now, well first, this virtual hug for everybody. And now please receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. God's shalom today and every day. Amen.